Hi, my name is Jan Sobisch, and I'm going to present joint work with Anita and Georg on breaking the interpost path with reliability attacks. I want to start with a quick introduction. What are physical and clonable functions? So puffs are a hardware function. You can think of them as a module embedded on an integrated circuit. And these have an interface where you can apply challenges and then you get a response. And you can think of these in the context of this talk as bit vectors. So the puff maps bit vectors to bit vectors. And the trick is that uh, the process variations that occur during manufacturing of the integrated circuit guarantee uniqueness of this mapping. So whenever you implement two different, or when you manufacture two different instances, uh, puff A and puff B, they will have a unique mapping. And so you can identify them by their responses. You can use them in a very simple uh, protocol where um, you have an enrollment phase after manufacturing, and there you build a secret database of challenge response pairs. And then later in the field, the puff can be authenticated by selecting a specific challenge and checking whether the um, response sent from the puff is the same as the one in the database. Now, this protocol can only work for so-called strong puffs because um, they have a, a really large challenge space that is exponential in some design parameter. Um, so the, um, the advantages of, of these puffs are that um, they are cheaper to manufacture and supposedly they are more secure than traditional crypto-based solutions. So here you don't have a secret key that you need to protect and it is assumed that invasive physical attacks are not really feasible on puffs, at least in an ideal scenario. Um, now, why don't you see strong puffs um, um, in, the, in the field, deployed in the field? Uh, well, all candidates so far that have been proposed have been broken by modeling attacks. So what an, an, an attacker can try to do is um, they can select, um, record a large set of challenge response pairs. This is assumed that it's feasible in the attacker model. And then they can try to build some mathematical model. And as soon as their mathematical model um, is able to perform this mapping from challenges to responses uh, with high fidelity, uh, high accuracy, then the security of the puff is broken. Um, so where now does our um, contribution come in? Um, at Chess 2019, Nguyen et al. introduced a new um, design, the Interpose Puff. And this design had some new ideas um, to um, provide security against the um, state-of-the-art attacks. Um, especially uh, the focus was on reliability attacks, which are the most devastating attacks because they require the smallest training set. Uh, already a year later, um, at Chess and uh, Visual et al. showed that um, security is, is not quite as good, uh, the security of the IPOF, as it was claimed or as it was hoped. And um, this year, we show that also reliability attacks are possible, um, which break the original security claims. Um, so to understand the attack and the design, uh, we need some preliminaries. Uh, first, uh, you need to know the arbiter puff, which is the building block um, of um, most strong puffs. Um, it consists of a number of stages. And you can see that each stage has a, a challenge bit applied. And what this challenge bit does is basically it uh, determines whether the paths that the signal paths that run through the stage uh, are crossed or whether they are sent straight through. So here, for example, a zero is applied and the um, blue and the red paths are crossed. Um, now to query the puff, you apply a, a signal at the beginning and then you have two signals uh, racing through these stages. And at the end, the arbiter determines which of the two signals arrives first. And this determines the single response bit. So what the arbiter does is it evaluates the sign of the delay difference D. Um, now, as it turns out, this puff can be modeled uh, very well with just N plus one parameters, where N is the number of stages. And to do this, you have a weight vector W, which um, basically is equal to, or equals the, the physical delays um, that are applied to the signals. 
and you have a parity vector, which is basically a function of the applied challenge. And with uh, these two vectors, uh, you can compute the true delay by a simple scalar multiplication. Now, uh, if, you, if you model um, a real path, um, what you always have is noise. So whenever you have two signals racing through here, um, there will be some noise. And um, you can model this with a Gaussian variable. Um, as you can see on the bottom right, um, you have a decision threshold. And whenever the delay is below that, um, the response bit is zero. And if it's um, higher than this decision threshold, it's one. And uh, you can see uh, if the noise is large enough and uh, it gets added to your true del delay, it might be possible that you cross the decision threshold and your response bit flips. Uh, this will become important later on. Um, and we'll talk about the reliability attack. Um, so as you saw, um, the path can be described by a very simple linear model. Uh, this means that it can be trivially broken by modeling attacks. Uh, so what people did was they um, composed paths consisting of multiple arbiter paths. So the most well-known one is the XOR path, where you have uh, multiple arbiter path um, instances and their responses are just simply XOR together to get a single response bit. And um, this nonlinearity really helps. It uh, increases your training set size. So now your training set size is exponential in the number of arbiter paths that are in your design. Um, but still there's a problem because as we saw, the arbiter paths are noisy. So you cannot combine too many of these. Otherwise your um, response bit will be really noisy and you cannot use the path in authentication. Um, all practical instance sizes of this buff can be broken, um, and as we later see. Um, now, based on the XOR path, um, Nguyen and I developed the interpose path, which is basically a composition. You have the upper X XOR path, um, which introduces a new challenge bit into the original challenge. And then you have the, the lower Y path, Y XOR path, which is evaluated now on this augmented um, challenge. And this, this RY is, then is your true response bit. Um, so how do you attack these paths? Um, so the general model is um, you have challenges and responses. You have a lot of pairs of these. This is your training set. And now you're trying to find a model that maps these challenges to the responses. And your model has some internal weights. So it has a weight vector W. Now, what you can always do uh, as an attacker, you can just pick a random W. You can start somewhere in weight space and then try to make your way to a good solution that uh, provides a good mapping. So one thing you can do is uh, you can get a local loss function L. And what this function does is it um, basically measures how well your current pick W um, is in predicting a single challenge, um, the response for a single challenge. And based on this function, what you can do is you can um, build a sum that basically tells you for your whole training set how well your current pick W is performing. And now uh, you can enter an optimization loop where you evaluate your loss um, and then you try to tune your W such that you move towards a minimum in this uh, loss landscape. So if you use gradient, gradient, exam, uh, gradient descent, for example, um, you evaluate the gradient at the point where currently are and then um, follow the gradient towards um, a minimization of the loss function. So this is um, how you can think uh, these um, attacks are performed. Um, so in, in the classical modeling, you just use challenge response pairs. And uh, who am I at? I showed uh, that logistic regression um, is able to um, break XOR paths for all, uh, basically all possible or feasible um, instance sizes. Um, Wiesel et al. showed how this uh, technique can um, be adapted to the interpose path, even though they did not provide a, uh, a fully differentiable model of the IPath. Instead, they showed that you can uh, basically divide and conquer the interpose path um, and attack the, the different parts separately. 
So now turning to the reliability attack. Um, what you can do as an attacker is you can query the puff, for example, an arbiter puff, multiple times for the same challenge. So now you have one challenge and you have, um, in this case, T repetition, um, T times the, the response bit. And uh, as we saw, the, the response may flip at certain times if the noise is large enough. Uh, based on these T um, response bits, what you can compute is a reliability score. And this just basically tells you uh, how noisy your response bit is for the specific challenge. Um, now, the, the observation is that this reliability score gives you information how the magnitude of the delay difference D looks like. So looking at the blue example, we can see that the true delay is pretty close to the decision threshold. This means that you don't need a lot of noise to cross this decision threshold, so your response will be rather noisy. In contrast, here in orange, you can see that um, your true delay is pretty far away from the decision threshold. So you would need a lot of noise, which is quite uh, unlikely to cross to the other side. So this is a, a stable um, stable response. So there we have this connection um, and this, uh, this, this information that you get from the reliability score. Um, how do you use this to attack X or puffs? Well, the observation is that um, the re uh, reliability score of the single outer path correlates with the overall uh, reliability score of the, of the um, global re response bit. And this is simply because due to the X operation, whenever your uh, noisy arbiter path A, for example, flips its response bit, then also the global response bit will flip. So you have this direct correlation. And on the previous slides, uh, we saw that uh, in turn, the um, reliability score of your individual arbiter path correlates with the magnitude of the delay difference. So now we have one um, value that can be observed by the attacker and one value that can be predicted by your model. And now um, this directly leads to attacks in which you can find the arbiter paths. So what you do is you simply try to find with an optimization routine, would you try to find an arbiter path um, that has a high Pearson correlation with your observed global reliability score. So, and whenever you, you run this optimization, it yields you exactly one arbiter path candidate. Now the observation is um, that you need to run this attack multiple times because you need all of the individual arbiter paths. And what can happen is that um, the um, probability that you encounter each arbiter path in the optimization runs uh, is probably not, not equal. So in this case, for example, um, uh, I have arbiter path A, which is just more likely to be found because its, its minimum is more pronounced compared to arbiter path B. Um, so the, um, some arbiter paths are more likely to be learned than others. And this is exactly the idea that Nguyen et al. Um, used for the uh, security of their construction, because they said, okay, we have this X orbiter path. Uh, if we put it uh, in the top, then it will have much less uh, effect on the, overall, um, um, on, the, on the overall response bit. So the correlation between the reliability of the X X orbiter paths and the overall reliability score is pretty low. And um, according to the analysis, this means that it's highly unlikely that all XOR arbiter paths uh, that belong to this top path will be actually found. Um, in general, we could follow the argument and uh, with simulations, we could see that indeed uh, the X arbiter paths have a lesser correlation with the global reliability score. And in turn, the, the Y puffs, uh, you will find them more easily because they have a larger correlation. However, um, we came up with the idea that you don't have to run um, the, um, the same optimization routine always again. Instead, you can resort to adaptive reliability attacks. And the idea is, let's say you have found the first minimum so you have optimized um, in this area and in, in the um, topology of this blue uh, curve, and you have found a minimum somewhere here. 
What you can do is now you can uh, modify your, your optimization uh, target. You can say, okay, I never want to go here again. So I add additional loss where I ended up. And now you end up with a new target function, this green one, which does not have the same minimum anymore over here. So um, you will explore other minima in the loss landscape. So you might end up over here if you run the optimization now again. And um, this is already, um, yeah, uh, this idea is already a direct, um, a direct challenge to the IPAF security argument. And uh, next we will see a few more steps that we undertook to um, get a practical attack. So um, learning one arbiter path at a time still, if you um, do this adaptive attack still is, is somewhat cumbersome. We found it that you need a lot of manual tuning. So instead to um, build like an efficient attack, um, we resorted to learning all arbiter paths at once. So um, you perform the reliability attack in parallel on all arbiter paths. And um, to prevent them from converging to the same um, solution, you discourage the similarity um, by adding uh, constraint terms. Um, and we did um, an, another modification, um, which is also important. We added another term to the, um, to the optimization goal. Uh, and this term is basically uh, your classic um, machine learning attack, which um, just measures how well your model uh, produces uh, predictions for uh, the response bit. So now you have three terms, the classical logistic regression loss. So your global model, how well does it predict uh, responses? You have another term in blue, uh, which encourages the individual avatar paths to, uh, um, to show a high correlation with the reliability score. And you have one optimization goal, uh, which discourages um, the arbiter paths from converging to the same uh, solution. So it, it's, it counteracts a little bit this reliability correlation term. So um, it doesn't take overhand. Um, we ran some experiments uh, against simulations um, that show that um, this, including all your available information is actually beneficial. So in blue, you have the original reliability attack and uh, in orange, you have a constraint term. So now the uh, outer paths are discouraged from converging to the same solution and green additionally um, has this uh, logistic regression loss. And what you can see is that in attacks on the 5.5 five, uh, interpose path that uh, with our modified approach uh, in green, then you actually are able to find all arbiter paths and to model the complete path. Um, so I briefly want to mention some technical steps that were also important in our attack. Um, in the original um, reliability attack, the uh, optimization routine was CMAS, which is a uh, evolutionary, strategy, evolution, evolutionary strategy approach. And we just replaced this by gradient descent um, because we actually found a differentiable model and then gradient descent uh, usually beats CMAS. Um, so we also had to find a, um, a differential model of the IPATH. Um, here, we just had to modify the computation of the, um, of the feature vectors of this parity vector phi. And um, yeah, the, the details are in the paper. It's just a small technical step. And then you have um, a complete differential model of the complete IPATH. And um, Another, another technical issue that we had to solve was finding good constraints for the IPATH because you really, really need to watch out that you don't end up with uh, Y A paths in places where you need the X arbiter paths because this design is asymmetric, but the reliability attack um, in the original formulation does not know this and um, cannot sort them. And this actually took quite a lot of time. And again, I, I uh, refer to the paper where we have uh, all the details on this. Um, so looking briefly at the results, um, what we can see here is that we were able to break the 110 IPATH. This is important because it was uh, proposed as a secure instantiation. And um, the 110 IPATH with 64 stages um, is of a size 
if you were to run a um, classical machine learning attack, um, then you probably wouldn't be successful because it would require um, billions of challenges. But with the reliability information included, you just need a couple hundred thousand and the time is also very much feasible and as always could be further optimized. Uh, we will also be able to, to run attacks on, on XX IPUFs, for example, the 77 IPUF. I have to mention that uh, this was a bit more involved. We had to um, run the attack in multiple stages um, because there's a lot of fiddling around with, with numbers and with, with optimization goals. Um, so this is an area where the, our attack could still be improved. Um, but nevertheless, we were able to, as I said, break the 77 IPUF. Um, the most important takeaway result is, is basically the scaling uh, of the attack. Um, what you can see in blue is our attack, and uh, the y-axis is uh, scaled logarithmically. And what you can see is, is that, the, uh, that our attack scales somewhat linearly. So in contrast, you have um, three um, other curves here, uh, which are all um, logistic regression-based attacks. And these all scale um, um, exponentially and they don't take reliability information into account. So the takeaway is if you take the reliability information, you can, at, at, and you can attack really, really large instances uh, and the security of the IPUF in this uh, attacker model is uh, actually broken. Um, so what's the conclusion? As I said, um, the IPUF actually does not hold up to its claims. Unfortunately, uh, reliability attacks are still possible. And what we really want to show, also show is with, with our um, methodology is that these attacks, um, you have a lot of flexibility in building these. Um, so the specifics about certain optimization algorithms do not matter as, as much. You have a lot of freedom in how you can compo uh, compose uh, optimization objectives. And um, so the takeaway is it's, it's, it's somewhat hard and, and technically involved to, um, to run these attacks um, and to really test your design on, um, on for, for certain um, state-of-the-art attacks, it's really not, not that easy. Uh, another technical note, um, in the future, if you want to uh, run such kind of attacks on, on your own designs to find improvements, um, do use modern libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow um, to develop these attacks. That makes it much, much easier and uh, it's much more enjoyable than crafting code uh, by yourself or com uh, grading computation, for example. Um, with that being said, um, thanks for your attention. That's it from me.